Okay, we're almost there. Now just grab the one to your left. No, 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 your other left. Oh, come on, Doug. Just, here, just give me the Oh, hey, everybody. Rolling my card castle here with the Sticky Paddle Gaming Network. Woo! A lot's been going on since the last season of Creepy Gaming. My roommate, Doug Ratman, unfortunately, is finally moving out. It's okay, though. I understand. He found a better place for a better price. Plus, that attic can't be too comfortable. Anyways, where's my manners? Let's do this the right way. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, freaks and geeks, trolls and nerds alike, welcome. Well, come on. I'm Mullet Mike with the Battle Gaming Network in full screen, bringing you Creepy Gaming 7. Can you believe that? Seventh season? I didn't even know I could count that high. You like the new set? Huh? Okay, it's really, it's the old set. But hey, look, we got so much more room now. We got all kinds of room for activities. We can do so many activities. It's awesome. We can do karate. Been teasing it for a while now, but I thought it was only fitting that since this is season seven, after all, we will be talking about, for our season opener, none other than Resident Evil one through six. See what I did there? Because seven and everything, oh, never mind. All kidding aside, it's a double feature, folks. Hey, don't worry about it. I told you I was going to do it. I am going to cover Resident Evil 7. But in this video today, I'm covering Resident Evil 1 through 6. If you want to see what I think of Resident Evil 7, it should be up right now for a Season 7 double feature. Thanks to everyone who recommended these episodes. They are well earned. As a matter of fact, Thank you all. Thank you all for making seven seasons of creepy gaming possible. It blows my mind. As a matter of fact, we are even going to be hitting our 100th episode of creepy gaming this season. Wish me luck. I'm going to need it. So, without any further ado, turn the lights down and the volume up as we journey into some creepy gaming. chilled me to the bone as a kid. I often get asked, what games have scared you, the ever handsome mullet Mike? The first two Resident Evil games definitely belong there, and seven isn't too far off, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Yes, while some of the first games admittingly didn't age well in their original forms, they hold an important place in video game history. And if you don't believe me about them not aging well, then go back and play the original Resident Evil and check out that wonderful voice acting. Hey! Come here! Joseph! All kidding aside, Resident Evil, also known as Biohazard in Japan, holds a special place in creepy gaming history because it is technically the first survival horror game. Now, I can literally smell my comment section down below catching a blaze after such a statement, but allow me to explain before you work your way into an early carpal tunnel diagnosis. Yes, there were other horror games like Clock Tower and Alone in the Dark, but Resident Evil was the first game to coin the phrase and be categorized as survival horror rather than just horror. The games share many ongoing themes, one of which is survival, like I said. And by that, I don't just mean staying alive. The term is in reference to the fact the Resident Evil games don't give you a lot of ammo or health, forcing you to ration, making you survive. Over the course of 20 years, the series has had several theories, easter eggs, and memorable creepy moments. 
Other themes in the franchise include limited save points, eerie atmospheres, puzzles, an ever-growing narrative, and... <sighs> Zombies. Yep. Zombies. <sighs> okay, so most of y'all know I can't stand zombies. They're just so overused. But, to be fair to this game, Resident Evil was one of the first video games to bring zombies back into the pop culture since George Romero's Living Dead films. So, we have to give credit where credit's due. That being said, let's take a look at the first game. Resident Evil Released in 1997 by Capcom and directed by Shinji Mikami, Resident Evil puts you in the role of two playable characters, Chris Redfield and Jill Valentine. The premise of the game is relatively simple. Your characters are members of STARS, a rescue team. In the game's opening cinematic, you are chased down by mutated hellhounds into the mansion where the game takes place. Through playing, we find out that the Umbrella Corporation is behind what is known as the T-Virus, thus unleashing mutated zombies and monsters galore. As forementioned, the entire game takes place on the mansion grounds. But the setting is what helped make this game so creepy. The Spencer Mansion was filled with puzzles, and whatever you do, don't ever try exiting through the front door. Hey guys, why don't we just use this door? It's unlocked. Never mind. Here's a creepy fun fact in our first eerie theory. That there are not one, but two predecessors to the original Resident Evil. Capcom's Sweet Home and the aforementioned Alone in the Dark. Also directed by Shinji Mikami. Many people even call Sweet Home the original Resident Evil. Definitely check them out if you haven't by now. Whether they take place in the same universe or not has been theorized and debated for years. But one cannot deny the mansion layout being an integral part of Resident Evil. A lot can be said for the original, both good and bad. I will say this, even though it might not have aged well, it was a forefather in gaming. Just being a kid when these games came out, they terrified me. The creepy old mansion, the dark gothic atmosphere, the threat of zombies lunging at you, the unforgettable, unapologetic game over screen. That's harsh. Damn. The various creatures and mutants running around the house and just overall feeling of terror the game gave you as you constantly ran out of ammo is more than enough to forever go down in creepy gaming history. Not just that, but Resident Evil was also one of the first games to feature notes. A cliche I've grown to hate, but I understand why they did it. Because of the hardware limitations and, and, not to mention, the first Resident Evil had one of the most memorable, epic moments in gaming history. The Sticky Paddle now brings to you epic moments in video game history. Now we here at the Sticky Paddle have already established the importance of the Resident Evil series for being groundbreaking in its time. The title was riddled with scary and memorable moments. I personally felt like there were several epic moments, but one in particular stands out. Early in the game, once entering the notorious Spencer Mansion in the Arkalay Mountains, players were met with the series' first zombie. While it can be considered tame now, for its time this upcoming scene was terrifying. You gotta remember too, when it was released, most players had never seen anything like this. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you an epic moment in video game history. A 
again, may seem tame now by today's standards, but think about it. Horror games weren't as predominant then as they are today. Throw a rock now and you'll probably hit a new horror title, but back in 1997, most players at the time were accustomed to Mario or Sonic. Not this! I find it funny, as simple of a moment as it is, it has obviously left a lasting impression on the video game world. One that we are still talking about to this very day, over 20 years later. And this has been yet another epic moment in video game history, brought to you by the Sticky Paddle Game. Following the success of the first game, Capcom decided to capitalize and create a sequel. This installment was directed by Hideki Kamiya. Resident Evil 2 featured the new setting of Raccoon City and the haunting police station. Personally speaking, this is my favorite of the original trilogy. And for multiple reasons. Rather than returning as Jill Valentine and Chris Redfield, we now play as two new characters. Leon Kennedy and Claire Redfield, sister of Chris from the first game. Leon is the new recruit for the RCPD, and Claire is searching for her brother who went missing after the mansion incident. It's interesting to note that the game was almost completely rebuilt after nearly being finished. Another creepy fun fact I found interesting, the ridiculously disturbing North American ads. Yeah, those were actually directed by the father of modern-day zombies himself, George Romero. I remember these commercials terrifying me as a kid, but at the same time, as scared as I was, I was intrigued. If you think about it, this could really be the origins of creepy gaming. That's probably another reason that this is my favorite of the original series. This was the first Resident Evil I ever played. That's right, I'll admit it, no shame in my game. It wasn't until after I beat RE2 that I finally got my young hands on an M-rated director's cut of the first game. My card castle does not condone this action. I don't think it was just that though. The opening cutscene was terrifying, but it hooked you into the story. It's one thing for there to be a few zombie experiments roaming a mansion in the Arkelite Mountains, but now the Brain Eaters have hit the streets! Raccoon City has been completely taken over. Not just that, but the setting of this ridiculously elaborate police precinct was awesome. I enjoyed it more than the Spencer Mansion in the Arkelite Hills. It just felt like something out of Gotham City. And since advancements in the technology, the creature design was much scarier, in my personal opinion, as well. Much like the zombie's initial appearance in the first game, there was another cinematic that genuinely creeped me out. This nightmare generator is what is commonly called a liquor. And yes, that name is giggle-worthy. But the creature is not. Joseph! It might just be me, but these guys genuinely terrify me. I've had hypno-like dreams where there were like three chasing me. Ugh. Resident Evil 2 also introduced the characters Ada Wong, a future mainstay, as well as Mr. X. Look familiar? More on Mr. X and Nemesis than that eerie theory here in a bit. The game was two discs, just like its predecessor, so Capcom continued the tradition of replayability. One awesome unlockable is a minigame called The Fourth Survivor, where you play as a mysterious character simply known as Hunk. And yes, that's giggle-worthy too. Joseph! You are the remaining survivor of an Umbrella Task Force similar to Stars. There's an interesting theory regarding Hunk that even ties into Resident Evil 7. Be sure to check out that video if you want to hear it. Now, I can talk about RE2 all day but we still have a lot to cover. I'm sorry, but Resident Evil 2 is an excellent survival horror game. 
I know I may be a little biased based on my own personal nostalgic memories, but how can I have an award-winning web series called Creepy Gaming and not at least mention these games? Awards pending. Regardless whether they have aged well or not, the terror was there. And in some places, still is. Resident Evil 3 this game has a very interesting backstory. The original concept for the third installment was meant to be a vast departure from the series, but much like Resident Evil 2, this project eventually got scrapped and developed into the franchise we know today as Devil May Cry. Once the original idea was changed, the development team was split into two separate groups. One team worked on Code Veronica, while the other worked on what we now know as Resident Evil 3. Overall, the game's okay, but it's not my favorite. The creepiest redeeming factor in this game, though, is Nemesis. He's this hulking, unstoppable brute, which is scary enough, but, well, just look at him! Tentacle porn mo It's like no matter what you do, there's no stopping him. He's a steroided out version of Mr. X, which is pretty cool because this game takes place at the same time as Resident Evil 2. You return in the role of Jill Valentine from the first game, and the basis of the game feels pretty lacking for the most part. As Jill, you were just supposed to outrun Nemesis and escape Raccoon City. Even though it's technically not, the game feels very linear. This title was on just one disc, and you just play as Jill for the most part. And to me, anyway, it just feels more like some side story, not deserving of being a numbered title. Again, just my opinion. There's a pretty cool creepy Easter egg before I move on, though. It's a nice touch that really connected RE2 and 3 even more so. Brad McVickers from the first game gets attacked and killed in Resident Evil 3. But if you know where to go under the stairwell outside of the police department in RE2, you will find who is believed to be Brad McVickers. But now he has changed. Next up as an honorable mention, Code Veronica. I won't talk about this one much. I know I said I was only going to cover the numbered titles, but personally speaking, I feel that this game deserves to be the true Resident Evil 3. It just has better all-around characters, more to it, and just furthers the ongoing plot. This game was only one disc as well, but that's because this game was released on the Sega Dreamcast. This installment was about Claire looking for her brother, Chris Redfield. The game was darker and scarier than previous installments, making this game stand out against the rest. The Rockford Island setting made the game feel more claustrophobic and creepy. We also got some questions answered regarding the Ashford family and series baddie Albert Wesker. Speaking of the Ashford family, there's a pretty creepy Easter egg regarding the Ashford family mansion. It looks nearly identical to the Spencer Mansion from the first game. Theories and speculation immediately arose amongst players. Was the mansion from the first game just some mock-up experiment? Resident Evil 4 Five long years, fans of the series had to wait to get a true follow-up to Resident Evil. Sure, there were a ton of sequels and spin-offs, but it wasn't until 2005 that gamers got the numbered sequel they had been waiting for. RE4 definitely shook things up, but stayed true to the series as well with many franchise themes returning. And to me, that's just a good sequel. It didn't hurt that the original game's creator Shinji Mikami returned to help with this project. 